Yeah, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we can start. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, my name is uh, Marek Vashur, and today I'm going to talk about Ubud Food Blender and how to get it done right and how the Ubud project likes to see it done right in 2017. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Um, so, yeah, I'm a maintainer in these projects Ubud, uh, Linux, Open Embedded. Uh, I contribute to them quite extensively, uh, and I do also that for my day job. Um, I'm a software engineer, and I also do some FPGA work, but this is mostly hobby stuff. But uh, enough about me, um, let's get to the talk. Um, so I decided to split the talk into uh, multiple parts. Uh, the first one, I would like to introduce you to you with the bootloader so that we synchronize on the, the same page. We are all on the same page and that you all know what the Ubud bootloader is and what it can do. Um, after that I would like to show you some news which we received in the Ubud bootloader in 2017. Um, and once we get through that I'll just look into the two main pillars of the Ubud bootloader which is the driver model and the device stream support. And once you understand these two core concepts then uh, we can go through doing the Ubud port, kind of basic Ubud port. Uh, in this case, I'll really just show you how to get a better Ubuntu Ubud running, but with the latest, greatest technology. And after that, uh, since that can grow the Ubud size considerably, uh, I would like to look at the low memory systems and how to optimize the Ubud so that it fits <coughs> into systems with memory constraints. And once that is done, we'll conclude the talk. So. Um, what is a U-boot bootloader? Uh, how many of you actually heard about U-boot bootloader or use it? Can you raise your hand? Oh, that is very nice. Like, more than half. That's very nice. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, um, for those of you who do not know, U-boot bootloader is, uh, yeah, well, bootloader. It's the first code that runs when you flick your system up. Uh, but actually, I have this, this little number one in there on the slides. It's not really a first code which runs because on modern SOCs, usually what happens when you turn the SOC on is that there is some sort of boot from inside the chip itself. And that is executed after you power the system up. Now, that boot ROM is responsible for doing some basic initialization of the system. And once that is done, it loads the, probably the bootloader or some other code from some storage and executes it. So the bootloader would technically be the first code and the bootloader would be like the second code which runs. Uh, then again, the bootloader is the first code which you can replace on that system. And yeah, its, it's responsibility is basically to initialize the hardware, uh, do some sort of basic hardware initialization to the point where it can load the subsequent software piece uh, be it a Linux kernel, it can be something else, and execute it. So then the, well, the kernel or whatever you execute takes over and the bootloader goes away. It's no longer used. Um, in case of U-Boot, uh, it can do other things. It can be a boot monitor, debug tool, so uh, when you reach the U-Boot shell, you can access stuff like USB, I2C, SPI buses, all that sort of stuff is available there if you configure it in. And you can use it to also debug hardware. Uh, when you do some sort of port bring up, you can just bring up U-Boot and then, oops, see, something happened. And then, well, very quickly uh, poke into hardware, see if it works or it doesn't work or if it's flaky or whatever. Uh, so now there's an example of how the U-Boot works when you power it up. Um, uh, this is the sort of print you get when you start U-Boot up. Uh, in this case, we see that there is some sort of CPU from Renaissance there. Uh, it has I2C available, it has Flash available, it has some DRAM available, SD cards, uh, serial ports, and so on. And ultimately, you reach the U-boot shell. If you interrupt the auto boot, uh, you get the shell, and you can, for example, look at the, what is that, serial port registers yeah, with the memory dump command. So here I am kind of debugging my hardware there. Right. That's what the U-boot is. Um, now, there are a couple of news which happened in 2017. Obviously, uh, we keep uh, device tree control migration. 
uh, that's been going on for a couple of years. It's getting far better in 2017. Also, uh, driver model migration that's been going on since uh, 2012, I believe. And this is also getting so much better. There is really a continued stream of patches with every release. Uh, more driver model stuff is getting in. More drivers are getting converted okay, or removed because some of them are just obsolete ancient stuff. And no one cares, so we just remove them. Um, we recently got the EFI support. Um, the idea behind that is that um, effectively you would behave as an EFI library. SUSE uses that a lot. Um, what they do is they use uBoot to start Grub, and then Grub actually calls into the uBoot again and uses the uBoot services to, for example, access serial port, access storage. So that, that's what the EFI is about. Um, in case this is your thing, knock yourself out, it's available. <coughs> Um, another thing we got is this throw boot command. Uh, this is sort of a predecessor to this FE stuff. So, um, you know, we have all these embedded systems. And uh, uh, there are a couple of distributions who wanted to be able to have some sort of standard new boot environment so that they are able to just, you know, install the distribution and boot the system up. Uh, so they agree on the set of scripts, set of UBoot scripts, which is the distro boot command. You can enable it with config uh, cmd distro, something like that. And it's really a good idea to have that, because having all these ad hoc UBoot environments, this is just a mess, so you shouldn't use that. Um, yeah, and another thing which will probably trigger Frank over there is uh, DTO support. So in the UBoot 2017-11, we got support for device tree overlays because uh, somehow it didn't make it into the kernel or part of it. So uh, there was a way to work around it was to put it into UBoot. And what UBoot does is it loads fit image, which then has a kernel in it and device tree and a couple of DTOs in it and uh, assembles those, DT those DTOs onto the device tree and then passes the device tree, which is patched with those DTOs to the kernel. So let's kind of circumvent the uh, back pressure from the Linux kernel uh, device tree maintainers, I would say. Uh, yeah, so there's that. Um, in case you have some sort of reliable hardware, uh, take a look at the device tree overlay support in UBoot. Uh, but be careful, there will be some changes, it seems. Is that right? I, I'm uh, hoping for such. It's a long term thing. Yeah, so in the long term, there may be some changes. So that's something to keep in mind. <coughs> now, um, I would like to start with device tree, because this is what we use in the U-Boot, and uh, I would like to look into it. So how many of you have an idea what device tree is? Um, very good. That's nice. Uh, so yeah, device tree, just to synchronize the others again, uh, is uh, basically a hardware structure. Of, oh, spread that is a structure which is used to describe hardware. So any contemporary hardware today can be described uh, as a tree which contains nodes, and these nodes contain more nodes and uh, properties. And that's basically what the device tree is about. Now, the device tree is standard governed by the e-paper. I'll show you in a bit how the device tree actually looks like. Um, so there we go. Yeah, here's an example of, of a device tree. Uh, this is actually the device tree texture representation. Uh, what you can see on top of there, this is a bit of a specialty of the Linux kernel and actually also UBoot, is that uh, before the device tree is ran through the compiler, it is actually ran through a preprocessor. Uh, so we can have uh, symbolic names. Uh, without that, we would have to encode all these numbers explicitly into the device tree and it would be completely unreadable. So since we are running it through a preprocessor, you can have things like um, kick SPI, um, IRQ type level high, these sort of things there in the device tree. So it's much easier to read uh, by humans. Now, uh, what else you can see in there is that each device tree uh, starts with a root node. Um, right under the root node, on the, num on the line 2, you see on the line 3, there are a couple of properties. And below that, we have a CPU node with additional more properties and more nodes. And this is basically how you describe the entire hardware. 
So you start with the node, uh, which describes a bus or some sort of device. Under that, you have uh, more nodes, which describe the devices on the bus, and so on. You continue that way. Um, the device tree being a tree is actually a bit of a misnomer, I would say. Uh, because sometimes you have to reference nodes within the tree from other nodes within the tree, and that kind of generates a cycle. Uh, that's what's called the p-handle. You can see it at the bottom here. This thing, so that's a reference to the processor up there, day 57 underscore zero. Um, and this is usually needed for yeah, this sort of stuff, or in case you have some GPIO which you need to refer from, let's say, SPI controller, because that's used for your chip select. So that's the sort of thing device three is for. And now, uh, you would use this device three in two ways. Um, the boring way is that you would pass it to the kernel. Um, while doing so, you would patch a couple of nodes in the device tree. For example, the Ethernet address can be patched into the device tree uh, with a new boot. And this way, in case the bootloader patches the Ethernet address, let's say from some sort of storage which may not be available to Linux, it can then patch the Ethernet address to, to the DT and then pass it to the kernel so the kernel has correct Ethernet address. Um, it also allows you to change the Ethernet address in you and retain it with a Linux so it doesn't become a mess. Uh, but the more interesting way uh, we use device tree is that we pass device tree to the U-boot and U-boot can actually then use the device tree to figure out the topology of the hardware and configure itself. <coughs> um, this is enabled with uh, configure with control and actually the device tree is available early on in U-boot. Uh, so how early on is that? Well, um, the bootloader <coughs> early stages in case of U-boot uh, can be split into these four sections. First of all, when you essentially enter U-boot, what you enter is uh, CPU-specific uh, assembler code, which is like way up there, uh, which ultimately calls CRT0.S, and this sets up the C runtime for the rest of the U-boot. Uh, basically, once you leave CRT0, you have stack available and enough uh, of the CPU configured so you can run C code. Um, the next thing which is enter is this common uh, port F, which means port flash. And at that point, the U-boot is running from uh, read-only storage. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way today, but um, that's what it means and what it was intended to do. You do not have any sort of memory, with any sort of RAM available at that point. Now. Um, the uh, second item actually in the list in board in it, uh, F is uh, FTT deck in it, that means uh, FTT decoder, and that actually sets up the internal structures within you so you can access the device tree. So that early on you can read out information from the device tree within the boot. Now, if you go through all this board in the F, then at the end you will go through relocation. Um, which means you will put itself at the end of RAM. And after that, the DRAM allocator will be available, so you can start calling malloc and stuff uh, by the time you enter board um, error, which means you is running from RAM, yeah, the slides are actually not correct. Um, in case you happen to have some sort of hang within all these boardinate R and boardinate F, you can tweak uh, lib in it call C and just change the debug calls there into printfs and figure out where the system got stuck. So uh, that's kind of useful hint because it can just also happen that you will get stuck somewhere there and we'll try to figure out desperately how to figure out where you're actually stuck. So that file is super useful. Um, now if you look into how you would access this device tree, there are multiple ways to do it and it's actually becoming uh, bloody confusing. Uh, so, there is this FDT underscore functions which are provided by libfdt and you're supposed to use them only if you have no other option. This is like the most rudimentary way to access device 3 within you boot. Um, the other thing is uh, you can use FDT deck functions but they're being uh, decommissioned in favor of uh, driver model functions. Then again, they are kind of convenient wrapper around the uh, FDT functions. Uh, well, after that, we have uh, def read functions, which uh, are past uh, driver model device reference, and then 
they allow you to access device tree properties which are associated with that particular device and that particular node in the device tree. So that's kind of convenient access to your local device properties in the device tree. Um, and yeah, this is actually what you're supposed to use. Uh, there is also defftt get adder stuff which allows you to get like basic address of the device to which your driver bound and I'll talk about that in a bit. When I talk about the Ubuntu driver model, which is the other part of it. So um, I had a bit of a trouble finding out actually how to define the driver model, but uh, then I figured out, okay, well, let's take a look at what you would look like before and what changed with the driver model. So um, before the driver model actually happened, Ubuntu was like full of these if that macros and this, does, this didn't scale at all. So we had like commands which called directly into drivers from the shell. And if you wanted for your specific word to access some specific hardware, you just did an if def in there somewhere in the config files. That was terrible, it didn't scale. And then ultimately people started needing like to use multiple devices because their SOC had like at that point, let's see, two I square C buses. And if that stopped working at that point, so people started figuring out some hacks, how to like multiplex these I square C buses and stuff. Uh, ultimately, uh, this just didn't work out and we had to come up with something better. So in 2012, we started this driver model, uh, which became uh, a university project actually. And it turned out to be management disaster. Um, but uh, Google kind of picked it up, one guy from Google anyways, and he started uh, pushing a lot of patches into upstream view and now by 2017 we have a lot of stuff converted to the driver model. So what is this about uh, this driver model is that uh, it's, well, uh, yeah, it's basically a way to track devices and their associated data and uh, have multiple instances of all of them without all this if the ferry and basically get rid of that. So the driver model has uh, three core data structure. The, the first one is classes. Um, so each class uh, handles uh, one type of device, let's see, uh, I square C buses, um, SPI buses, USB classes, that sort of thing. And it provides a uh, the same API to access different kind of devices behind that. So whenever you call <coughs> I2C read byte, it goes into the class and that then finds a driver underneath that into which it calls with associated device to access that device. Um, then we have drivers, which uh, are pieces of software which actually map this standard class interface to a particular hardware to actual um, poking of the registers, that sort of thing. So that's what the drivers do. And then we have devices, which are instances of those drivers. Now, uh, the driver model core is designed to be really simple. It just tracks the lifespan of the driver and it's supposed to be inherently lazy. So what happens when the driver model ends itself, it just scans the device tree if that is enabled, binds all of the devices, but does not initialize anything. And until the device is initialized explicitly by some user of it. It's just left as it is. It's just left off. Um, yeah. So uh, we have a convenient uh, TM command there, which allows me to list uh, three of all drivers which are bound, and also mark those which are pro uh, from the Ubuntu shell. In this case, uh, what we see here is the root driver at the top. Uh, we see that the serial driver at the bottom there was actually broke because, well, serial console is active. So you can see it down there. Um, you also see that uh, pin moves was activated because someone needed those pin moves as the serial console, probably. Uh, but re the rest of the drivers are just not activated because they were not needed by anyone. And being this sort of lazy allows you to optimize boot time. Uh, that's the goal here. So what happens during the U-boot uh, driver lifecycle is that um, right up from the start, uh, the drivers are kind of all bound. Uh, there's optional bind callback in each of these drivers. 
which you can populate, but usually you don't have to because uh, you just use the default one. There is no action during the bind. Um, then the driver is probe. This probe call is called whenever anyone actually starts using the driver. That means you just do something like XSI square C bus from the shell or um, access the GPIO from the U-boot code, something like that. At that point, the probe function is called. And then you have two functions which are the opposite of that, which means remove and unbind. So uh, remove it's called um, when the driver is removed and it's supposed to shut down the hardware. Uh, this is, for example, useful when you are starting to boot Linux and you have to shut off some hardware so that it doesn't go into some confused state. Um, there was this case with USB device, which, in case it was left on, when you started booting Linux, it corrupted memories for some reason. So in the remove hook, that driver, uh, that device was actually restarted and shut down before booting Linux, and uh, everything was good. Um, what else is there? Unbind. Yeah, usually you don't have to populate that, um, but it's a counterpart <coughs> to bind. So, um, with device train driver model, we can do the U port. Um, are there any questions so far? <coughs> One question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, does U boot use device tree itself at all to describe these drivers, or is it all kind of hard coded? Yeah, it's actually uh, the driver model supports the device tree as well. So it can read out the entire device tree and find the drivers which it so knows. Uh, match the compatible string within the device tree. So when there was this thing here, this is actually all constructed from a device tree, which yeah. is passed to the UBoot. It looked like it. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's what it is. I actually had to cut this done, this one down a little, uh, because uh, the original output on this board was like from for like three more screens. So this is a little reduced one. Okay, any more? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, how common is it that you actually remove uh, or shut down hardware during the callback? Yeah, uh, so we do that on this particular board in the clock driver because we have to shut down a couple of clocks before we boot Linux. Um, you are supposed to implement this shutdown just to be sure so that you clean up the state before you jump into Linux so that Linux kind of gets the hardware in a sort of pristine state. Um, some of the drivers don't do it, some of the drivers do not have to do it. Okay. Yeah, um, so, um, yeah, porting you to a new board, that's kind of becoming easy now. So, uh, the task we will look into is uh, actually to start small, just get a, some sort of basic port with a serial driver and serial console output. Uh, because once you get serial console, you have the Ubu shell and you can kind of debug the entire system that way makes it easy and you have some sort of proof of concept that something works um, and on top of that uh, usually the serial well the serial hardware then needs some sort of uh, call controller input and uh, some sort of pin controller configuration um, but this can be actually hard coded by poking registers at the beginning and once you get the serial output running, then you can add clock controller driver and remove all this register poking. So you can kind of start small and keep adding up as you go. <coughs> uh, the serial driver for the serial SH looks like this. This is how we define it. So we have this U-boot driver macro, which actually generates an entry in a special section of the U-boot so that uh, when you provide the device tree, the U driver model in its itself walks this section and binds uh, and instantiated devi instantiates devices uh, which it knows. Uh, but what we have here in, in this uh, section is what? Yeah, well, we have name of the driver. You obviously need that. We have uh, U boot class. In this case, this is a serial driver, so U plus serial. Uh, we support matching on device 3, so I'll show you that in a bit. Um, we have the ability to convert uh, open firmware data to platform data. Now, this is useful in case you are supporting drivers which do both uh, platform data and device 3. 
and this is in turn useful on low memory systems, so I'll get to that in a bit. Um, what else do we have? Uh, platform data and private data pre-allocation. This is done for you by the driver model, actually, so you don't have to call malloc explicitly, but this is done in the driver model context itself. Um, yeah, then we have a probe function for the hardware, so it actually initializes the uh, serial port when needed. Um, we have operations which we provide to the U class, so that the U class can then uh, call these operations whenever the user wants to access the serial port. And we have a specific flag which says this driver should be available super early before the UPUD allocation because we want to have serial console like very early on. Uh, so device tree probing, this is actually super simple. <coughs> um, you just specify the uh, OFIDs just like you know it from the Linux kernel. Um, the conversion of uh, open firmware data to platform data is kind of optional, so we don't have to have that, uh, but otherwise, that is how it looks. In this case, we do what? Yeah, we decode the uh, base address of this serial port and turn it into platform data, which uh, the pro function then can conveniently quickly access. And yeah, serial driver operations, that's how they look like. Um, you pass them directly when declaring the driver. Uh, what we have here is uh, put character, get character from the serial board, that's if there is character, and yeah, that's implementation of the get character, for example. That's how it looks like. So what you get here is the, like this private data to the UART board, so you can stash, for example, your UART port space address there, and then you can, through the space address, access uh, UART port registers. So that's how we get a serial driver actually implemented. Not that difficult, it, although it might be a little overwhelming, but if you look into the driver serial, you will find some examples there. Um, the problem is that the driver model starts up a little bit early, a little bit uh, late in the boot process, and uh, so you might want to have a serial console a little earlier for that. We have kind of workaround, so uh, we have something called config debug UR and you define specific functions um, in the serial driver, which allows you to use explicitly one serial port uh, to do early serial console output in the boot, boot process, like super early on. Uh, the downside is that it has its own dedicated functions. Uh, it doesn't use the standard printfs, and this is really used only for debugging. Uh, this is how it looks. It's available on the, for example, Atheros hardware here. So what they do there is they define at the bottom debug UART funds. Um, they include debug UART header and then define the debug UART init and put C. And then every time you call this specific function, which is like the print hex or print C, whatever, um, the init is invoked and then the put C is invoked one way or the other. So this is how we can get uh, debug UR early on if you need to. Now, um, I mentioned that uh, the uh, serial port might actually need a uh, uh, clock into it and that you can hard code it at the beginning of the porting process somewhere in your like, early init code, but it's also a good idea to convert that clock framework ultimately. And the clock, fr clock framework is actually not that difficult. So basically, the definition of the clock driver is the same. You just use U plus CLK. Um, the ops are slightly different. So instead of like getting and putting character, you have clocks which allow you to you have uh, ops which allow you to disable clock, enable clock, set their rate, get their rate, that sort of thing. So this way, you implement your clock driver. And then the clock consumer uses CLK underscore functions again to manipulate the clock, like get set clock. Um, this is basically how the consumer looks like. So in this case, I am actually getting a clock handle from the device tree by the name of the clock in the device tree, so that's FCK. Um, if that succeeds, I enable the clock, I get the rate. It's really that simple. So that's an example of clock consumer in the serial driver. Um, another thing is pin control driver, yeah, it's, it's the same drill again. Um, this time it's uh, U plus pin control. The only thing about pin control is that 
Um, this is a bit of an overloaded framework because it does two things. It does pin multiplexing and pin configuration. So uh, pin multiplexing is um, that you can select which functional block within the SOC is actually multiplexed on a specific pad on the, um, on the chip itself, on the physical chip. Uh, pin clone is, uh, allows you to set properties of the, uh, of the specific pad. That means it's voltage level, um, pull-ups, pull-down, drive strength, that sort of stuff. And yeah, this, this is all wrapped into a single framework, unfortunately, but <coughs> that's how it is. Now, um, the uh, pin controller consumer has it quite simple, actually, because it can only select which particular pin controller configuration um, out of the available ones he wants to multiply some specific pins of a device. Yeah, and this is kind of difficult to uh, explain in terms in words, so this is how I'll, I'll illustrate it here. So in device three of this SD card controller, I have two different pin cones. One of them is for standard SD card, the other is for UHS mode. Um, the difference between these is that in the UHS mode, the pins are set to 1.8 volts. In the standard mode, they are 3.3 volts. And then in the SD card um, controller driver, if I get a set IOS notification set voltage to one or the other, then I just use the, uh, uh, what's that? Pin control select and select either of these pin control options and the framework handles all the setting of the, uh, of the pins behind the scenes. That's how it works. Yeah. Um, there are many other frameworks in U-Boot, which I'll not go through in here. We have the entire block framework that's DM already capable and DT capable. Um, the only framework which is kind of flaky at this point is MTD, which yeah, that, that kind of sucks. Um, so be careful there. There might be dragons. Uh, the problem is with um, driver model, the uh, size of the U-Boot can grow considerably. Uh, so you might want to optimize it for size. <coughs> Um, especially on some systems which might have uh, size limitations. Um, now, you would have some ways to deal with this uh, downsizing. Uh, so in case your system is heavily uh, size limited, that means like you have, for example, no DRAM <coughs> available, but just some sort of OCRAM. Uh, for that, we have U-Boot SPL, so that's like really cut down U-Boot where driver model and device 3 is optional, but it's actually available there. And what this usually does is that you put that into your um, OC RAM, it initializes your 3D RAM and loads U-Boot um, from some sort of storage into the DRAM, jumps into the U-Boot in DRAM and executes that, so that's sort of preloader. Um, I had a question here how big that can be or what's the size limitation here. So the SPL fits comfortably including device 3 and driver model into 64K. If you really cut it down, 32K is good. Um, but if you go below like a system with a 32K OC RAM, you might have issues. Um, there is a way around that. So there is something called the U-Boot TPL in case SPL is still too big. Uh, but this is something you should not use unless you really have to or something. So the TPL is kind of like a ternary program loader which allows you to load SPL. And it's usually used on systems with like one man flashes, which have like this 4K window where you put some code which loads stuff from the um, one end into some sort of OC RAM and then that is executed. So that's what the TPL is for. Yeah. <coughs> Now, um, another thing is, if you want to compact things down, uh, the decompaction uh, device tree blob itself can be quite quite big. Um, so, in SPL, in case we didn't have this special node in the device tree, uh, we cut down all the nodes, uh, which didn't have uh, you would DM pre relog uh, to reduce the device tree blob. You can also do that in uh, you would proper. Um, so there's that option. Uh, yeah, we use the FTT grab tool for that, uh, which has been added to libFTT, I believe. Is that correct? Or it could be some specific U-boot hack to libFTT. Um, I'm not sure, honestly. Anyway, I believe that was posted to the libFTT mailing list, at least. The FTT grab. 
Anyway, um, so that's one option. The other option is that you can compile actually device tree into platform data. And what that is useful for is that you can pluck out the entire libfdt from uboot or uboot spl and essentially just like take a couple of nodes in the device tree which are interesting to compile them in platform data and then init drivers using those platform data. And this can again be significant saving of space in the SPL. Um, you can configure other options out of SPL. So uh, if you look at the Uboot kconfig, there are specific versions of uh, kconfig config options, config underscore SPL, config underscore TPL. So if you want to disable something only in SPL, just set that to uh, is not set. And so yeah, same for TPL. And that's pretty much all I have, actually. Uh, so I would like to wrap it up somehow. Uh, in case you're doing a new U-Boot board, please uh, yeah, use device tree and use driver model. Avoid all these old, ancient interfaces. Uh, they are really not worth it. Uh, reuse goes at the code as much as possible. If you use some IP which already has driver in U-Boot, do not reinvent the wheel. Just update that driver. And in case something is not clear, um, there's always IRC, there's always mailing lists, so ask questions. Um, the IRC is a really good idea, just pop up on the IRC and you know, ask, wait a couple of hours maybe, because there is time zone difference between all these developers, so yeah, just, just do that. Um, IRC is a really uh, good place to ask questions. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and that's it. Any questions? I have a question. So how yep. about uh, DP bindings? Uh, so yep. you're using DP, but uh, the DP bindings themselves are somewhere else. Is that yep. work? Yeah, so what we try to do is basically just send people to the, to the Linux side and just run them through uh, the Linux DT review process, get them included in, in Linux, and once we have that, just use them in U-Boot. So you can start by writing a Linux driver down and then port it to U-Boot or something yeah. like that? Yeah, that's a good idea. Because then you know that the driver, uh, that the uh, DT bindings went through some review process. We really try to avoid like ad hoc DT bindings. Although, yes, we are guilty. We have a couple of ad hoc DT bindings which we need. So we are kind of abusing DT for not hardware purposes, but uh, um, we try not to do that. Yeah. Do you think it will be possible to share the hardware description? in the device tree with the Linux kernel someday? Or? Yeah, so uh, actually on this platform which I showed you in the in the talk, uh, I just synchronized the device tree bindings from Linux into you with every release of Linux kernel. So that now we are using 4.13. Uh, yeah, we have to patch a couple of uh, entries in the device tree so that the drivers are loaded early on. So we just add uh, the special view boot DM reload property into a couple of nodes in the device tree, but that's it. Otherwise, we just use the device tree from Linux. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is possible, yeah. It is actually done. Well, what I meant is to just put the file and work something like that. Yep. Well, if you put your effort into it, then yes. <coughs> it takes some cleanups, so yeah, but... That's basically the ultimate goal. And on some platforms, yes, it is possible. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, tell me about interrupts. Uh, do you use them somewhere, or is it mm -hmm. all the browser? So I know there were some platforms which used interrupts, but uh, we do not use them at all. We use polling in U-Boot as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, can we select you to use uh, still U-Boot or normal U-Boot? Yeah, you can do that. So actually the SPL binary is built separately uh, during the build process. So you get like an SPL binary <coughs> and a U-boot proper binary. And there's this possibility to use uh, Falcon mode, but the name of that feature is Falcon mode. But the SPL can actually, instead of loading and stuff, the U-boot can just load and start Linux kernel directly. Uh, I remember uh, U-boot for this code, uh, the SPL to code. Oh. Oh. Uh, you would, uh, you would for this board. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, no. 
ハードコードでっていうイネーブル SPL あっ、うん、cannot select a disabled、SP uh, uh, SPL mode Yeah,、uh, that's probably because you need to initialize、uh, RAM or something in the SPL, right? And then load the U-boot into RAM because the U-boot itself will not fit into the on chip memory, maybe. Could it be that? You can actually deconfigure SPL, you can disable SPL, that's possible. But、uh, the problem SPL is solving is、uh, that when you start the system up, you don't have enough、uh, memory to fit a U-boot proper into it. Which is the way、uh, to count a bit and select SPL or hard code to force you SPL? Which is the way?、Uh, selectable or force you? Well, it is always selectable. selectable.、Uh, but usually, when you use SPL, then you have a reason for that. Because you have these、uh, size constraints. <coughs> so, you have to use it. On such systems.、Oh. There are systems like the R64 machine that I showed you there, which just load the UBoot into already initialized RAM, so it has like 4 gigabytes of memory, and it just puts UBoot somewhere in the middle in there and starts the UBoot, and the UBoot can say, okay, yeah, well, I have plenty of RAM, so there is no problem, right? But if you have like a system which just loads 64 kilobytes of Flash into o c r a m and jumps into it, then you have to use SPL. Okay, I will suggest to. We can actually talk about that.、Hmm? We can actually talk about that. Oh, oh. <laughs>、uh, next time. <laughs> yeah,、um, yeah if, if you have some issues with that, we can talk about that. That's not a problem. Oh, let's do that.、Oh. Yeah. Could you tell me how the majority of the Uh, EFI supporting the、uh, UFOOT. How much what? How much are、uh, the majority?、Uh, maturity. Ah,、uh, yeah. Can、uh, we uh, boot the、uh, Grub、uh, support by your,、uh, what's it? You can boot Grub, yes. And、uh, also a Linux kernel、uh, for、e、EFI support. Yeah, so the thing is, what SUSE does is they actually use UBoot to boot FE application Grub. And then use the grub menu just to select whatever, boot、uh, SUSE, boot Fedora, whatever. So that the Jester just can boot the、uh, EFI application of the grub? Uh huh.、Uh, or well, the grub is the EFI application. Yeah, yeah. And、oh. uh, so that after boot, yeah, can you boot the、uh, Linux kernel? You can, yes. Oh, okay. That, that's the goal, basically. So, what、uh, SUSE wants to do is they want to have you put on these, let's say, RV7 <coughs> boards、yep. that puts Grub, and the Grub actually calls into u b o o t because the u b o o t is the EFI <laughs> library. Yeah, yeah. So, it calls there if you like, type a character, you know, that sort of thing. And then the Grub puts the Linux kernel. Okay.、Yeah. So, it looks the same if you use Grub on. Machine with you wouldn't、uh, FE, and it looks the same on your PC, and it looks the same on whatever other board.、Yeah, It's always the same kind of grab. I think that after boot,、uh, the Linux boot,、uh, oh. uh, you would still keep the Unix still, still in the memory, you can、uh, hold, can you? Ah, that sort of thing.、Uh, no.、Um. So the U boot is killed at that point. All the bootloaders are gone. Linux takes over and just does its own thing.、Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? No. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.